Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the latest in the run of our um, online community conversations. Uh, this week, um, or today rather, uh, we land in North Richmond and South Richmond wards, and we want to hear your questions later on, but uh, first and foremost, we need to do a few bits of housekeeping. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Councillor Gareth Robertson, I am the leader of the council. Um, I am not here as a panellist this evening, I'm here to sort of act as the, the chair and to funnel your questions towards the relevant councillor. However, I can behave um, on occasions like the new lifeline that you have on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire with the Ask the Host. So if there are questions which, the, which seem to stump um, the panellists, which I'm sure there won't because they're very experienced and knowledgeable councillors, uh, then they may want to... Uh, Throw, me a, throw the lifeline at my direction and I'll see if I can come up with any interesting salient points. The re event is being recorded um, for posterity and will be published after the event on the Council's website. So if you do ask a question, uh, just be aware that you will form part of the official record of this meeting. Um, if you do ask a question, then please do, if you've got your camera off, switch it on because it makes it so much more immediate and alive if we can both see and hear the questioners um, as they place their question. Now, you may be asking, how do I ask the question this evening? Well, it can't be simpler. Um, it's so simple, even I can understand it. And in here, on this Zoom chat thing, we have a chat function. All you need to do, if you want to ask a question, is write the word question. And the reason for that is that um, I will then look through the chat and I will come to you turn by turn by turn by turn by turn, and it's all nicely in order. Uh, please don't use the raise hand function because you will get taken out of the main list and we won't see you. It's, it's one of these weird things we have with Zoom. So just write the word question. Please don't write questions or enter into long chats in the chat function because what happens then is I sometimes miss uh, the fact that somebody has asked their question, you know, they've written it, and they get terribly shirty and accuse me of trying to stifle debate, which of course is not what we're here for at all. So what we need to do is to write the word question and then we will come to you in turn. Um, we are expecting there to be a lot of questions tonight about the issue of antisocial behaviour. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take probably the first half hour of the question session and we're going to talk about everything other than antisocial behaviour. So you may want to talk about home-based development and all of that. You may want to talk about the shops and all of that. So if we can take questions on anything not related to antisocial behaviour first, then that will be fabulous. Um, if you do speak, although we've done that bit, um, when you do speak, um, we do try to keep this as um, a pleasant an environment as possible. So if you could, um, I appreciate that sometimes temp tempers run high, but um, we don't want to have to uh, call on our, e um, our online bouncers who will step in and have a word with anybody who might be sort of overstepping the mark either in chat or I'm, I'm, this is North and South Richmond. I'm sure we won't have to worry about anything like that at all. So, you'll see the event etiquette. Do be respectful of everybody. We don't want to have to remove people. And um, after the event, after the event, we're going to be sending you all of the details regarding special links and what have you um, for the pertinent information that you may require that may have been raised during this conversation. So, we have a packed house of uh, people here to talk to you tonight, or to hear from you, rather. We have, for North Richmond, Councillor Richard Pine, Councillor Nancy Baldwin, and Councillor Richard Warren, I've just seen his arrived, excellent. And for South Richmond, we have Councillor Peter Buckwell, Councillor Pamela Fleming, and I hope Councillor Newton Dunn will be joining us at some point. I don't think he's been able to arrive just yet. Also from uh, the Richmond Police, we have Acting, Sar Acting Inspector Rumi Mir and Sergeant Scott Brody. So, that's your panel for this evening. How we usually kick these events off is to give some indication, some information about how the council has been performing um, over the last, oh, however many months it is since we went into lockdown. Um, so, and this is a short film which we're going to show you now, which will give you some idea of what we've been doing, what services have been provided, and how we've been reacting on your behalf during COVID-19. So if one of my people can start VT, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. The first half of 2020 has been an extraordinary period for all of us. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on all our lives. The Council has not been immune. 
The pandemic has brought huge challenges to us and to the way in which we deliver services to residents. Throughout the whole period, we have been committed to providing key services to all residents and help to those who need it most. As a snapshot of some of the things we achieved in just the first month of lockdown alone, we provided more than 6,000 hours of home care. We provided social care for over 1,600 vulnerable adults. We answered over 2,000 calls to our community hub. We provided 47 rough sleepers with accommodation. We delivered over 500 books directly to residents from our libraries and saw a 365% increase in people using our online library services. We had over 42,000 views of our online sports classes. We collected an estimated 47 tonnes of waste and recycling every day. And we kept our 51 schools open, providing education for over 500 children of key workers and vulnerable families. We know that things haven't always been perfect and many people have been frustrated by some of the lockdown measures that have been put in place and the fact that some of our services had to stop to ensure the safety of residents and staff. But we've been committed to prioritising those most in need. During this challenging period, I have been blown away by the continued incredible community spirit that we have seen across the borough. The pandemic has brought out the very best in so many of our residents, with neighbours providing a helping hand, the weekly clap for our carers and frontline workers, residents donating to food banks and the general willingness of so many to go above and beyond in their support for members of our communities. Following a call for volunteers, Richmond CVS received a staggering 3,000 applications from residents eager to help in any way they could. We have seen groups delivering food parcels, setting up virtual fitness classes, checking up on elderly residents that are shielding and collecting prescriptions. This generosity from residents and local groups has been genuinely humbling. And as we look to the future and towards recovery, we know that there are still huge challenges ahead. The recovery period provides us with an opportunity to make environmental changes that are needed across the borough and we have already started implementing some of these. For example, we have already started with our post-COVID-19 highway recovery strategy, looking at how we can ensure social distancing, encourage walking and cycling, and ensure our children can get to school safely. Over the next few weeks and months, we will be looking at other ways we can support local communities. And of course, residents will need to play their part in the future as they have done over the last few months. We've worked hard to ensure that businesses have received the funding they're entitled to, awarding a total of £35.79 million to over 2,100 local businesses. But now as our high streets begin to reopen, we all need to make sure that we support our local shops. Many of our businesses are run by local people, and if we don't use them, we will lose them. As we emerge from this difficult period and look towards recovery, we want residents to come on board and provide us with their thoughts and ideas on how we can create a better borough for all of our residents. This moment provides the council with an opportunity to reflect and improve the way we work and engage with residents and your support and ideas are key to that. Thank you for coming this evening and I look forward to hearing from you all. Okay, so those are just a few of the things that we've been doing over the last um, few, mo few months on your behalf. I'm sorry the uh, voiceover was slightly leaden. Um, I was hoping for statesmanlike in the approach, but it was a bit sort of dull. But the information, I hope you will agree, was interesting and informative. However, later on in the evening, there's going to be a second presentation, which is going to be uh, voiced by a professional actor. Uh, so you will find um, what spending a few extra quid and a jaunty background track will do. Now, what we're going to do next is to hear from the two wards. Uh, because we've got six councillors, we could be here all night, and um, whilst um, councillors do like to speak a lot, we prefer to hear from you. Uh, so we've nominated one councillor from each ward to give an update on behalf of their colleagues. So we're going to go straight to uh, Councillor Pam Fleming, who's going to give the update for South Richmond Ward. Please. 
Thank you. Um, well, firstly, uh, I mean, our residents, as, as you, you, you saw in the film, have been absolutely fantastic uh, looking out for each other. And the amount of WhatsApp groups that have sprung up um, is something that I hope will continue because it does keep neighbours in touch with each other. Thanks to our volunteers, um, great officers, and I'd particularly like to say thank you to Richmond Good Neighbours um, because and their volunteers because they have been absolutely amazing at um, supporting uh, people over the, uh, particularly over the lockdown period. Unfortunately, with the relaxation of lockdown, we have had huge antisocial behaviours on Richmond Green, the Riverside, um, in particular, I think, I think very, very worrying, the escalation of drug activity. We will be covering that later on. Um, and I know that um, Vivian Harris, um, Friends of Richmond Green, has particularly asked to um, have, a, have, a, have a few words and a slot about, about, about that. Um, so I won't actually say more about that at the moment, other than it has demonstrated um, that although we have a great Safer Neighbourhood team, uh, we re Richmond, because of its nature, does need a dedicated town centre and Richmond police team. And that really the current model of police safer neighbourhood policing um, simply doesn't really suit uh, a lively town like, like Richmond. It's also thrown up the problem of having no public toilet facilities. And I'm not really just talking about the antisocial behaviour here. I'm talking about the visitors and shoppers who we actually want and welcome to Richmond. And because in fact, the community toilet scheme is really no longer viable with COVID-19, um, because the hospitality sector um, and small businesses have got to observe social distancing and hygiene requirements. So that makes it virtually impossible for them to be members of the uh, community to toilet scheme. Uh, we are seeing, unfortunately in Richmond, uh, a lot of stores closing down. That's a huge worry. And um, I mean, not only does it mean that we are likely to see, sadly, more homeless people in their, and their belongings in the doorways, it's also about the viability of the town. Um, there, there, there is, there is um, B Richmond, the business improvement district, has done a fantastic job um, trying to persuade people and give people confidence to come out in shops. They're um, spraying, putting COVID-19, um, anti-COVID-19 spray on touch points in the area. They've got, and you'll see in many of the shops, um, this sort of safe space. And of course, they've also provided the um, very welcome flower, flower baskets. Uh, but um, we do need to be very conscious and to be looking at what we can do to um, bring back investment to Richmond. The House of Fraser development, as I think most people in the room will know, um, that has been given planning permission. And I think in time, uh, the, it, it, will, it will actually, the new investment of that and keeping retail and having new offices will help. Um, but it, it is um, going to be a, it, it is a, 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 worry, a worry for us. Um, I think that's, that's probably um, a, 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 a pretty good update from what, what's happening here. Other than I think to add just how much everybody's valued our parks and open spaces um, and sort of huge thanks to our officers for all they have done actually. And, um, and also keep our, our street cleaners and the Continental staff for keeping the open spaces so clean and tidy because they've had to endure an enormous amount of fly tipping and litter. So um, they don't often get thanks. So I think we should be thanking them as well. So I think that's probably up from it for now. Excellent. Thank you, Pam. Right, we're going to go to uh, Richard Warren. Councillor Richard Warren is going to give the uh, update for North Richmond. I saw Richard was in here earlier. Are you there, Richard? I, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. Excellent. Hello. I'm a stable connection, I'm afraid. I'm back now. Um, well, it's been a difficult 2020 so far. Uh, it began with the water mains burst, filling gas pipes in North and South Richmond uh, in January, leaving about 2,000 homes without gas or reduced levels of gas and some without electricity for a couple of weeks. And then, of course, we had the COVID-19 outbreak a few weeks later. Uh, in both, count, both cases, uh, war councillors, we have been referring vulnerable residents for help, first to Caden and then to uh, the council's own community hub during the lockdown. Um, lockdown and a change of contractor for our waste and recycling collections have created uh, more challenges, 
Uh, so as there was a big rise in the amount of uh, a tonnage that had to be collected and there have been missed collections, uh, these issues are persisting and we are really looking very hard to make improvements about for that. Um, as that lockdown has eased, uh, so another problem has arisen, so antisocial behaviour, which you referred to earlier. Uh, wherever we know of this occurring, we report it to the police and we urge residents to do the same. Uh, that way the police know where the hotspots are. On the plus side, our ward now has a full complement of community police officers after having been understaffed for most of the past two years. Um, other good news, Network Rail has agreed to our request to replace the pedestrian bridge at Sheendale Road with something less inviting to drug dealers and other antisocial types. Uh, this will happen within the next two years, finances permitting. Uh, new play equipment has been installed at the Tangier Road Triangle Playground and we have started a programme of encouraging friends groups to be established throughout the ward so that residents' voices can be heard more loudly, uh, which is very good when trying to secure funding for projects, for example. Uh, the first of these friends groups will be for the Rally Road Recreation Ground and work on that is underway. Um, residents should know that there is a consultation taking place on changing the cycle lanes and parking restrictions on Q Road. So we urge residents to take part in that. It ends on August the 26th. Finally, uh, the Mayor of London has just started a new consultation on revi a revised planning application for the Manor Road home base site. We are strongly opposed to this application and are in the middle of delivering 1800 street letters to affected residents and we will submit our written objections to the mayor and we will do so orally as well at the hearing on October the 3rd. Last night we heard that Sadiq Khan has also started a consultation on the Strag Brewery site. Um, I suspect these issues will come up in residents questions later uh, during this conversation. Chair. Okay thank you very much Richard for that. I, you know it shows what COVID does to the mentality that for the moment I'd allowed the gas leak and the gas outage in North Richmond to have slipped my mind and it, it just goes to show how you know how all-consuming COVID is and that of course when sorrows come they come not in single spies but in battalions um, for some of our communities. So on a slightly more upbeat note um, you'll be aware that the council is um, slightly adept at uh, taking money off people. Um, we're very good at that sort of thing. But uh, we decided that now's the time to demonstrate that we don't just have long pockets, we also have long fingers. And we have come up with what we call the um, Local Area Fund. Um, we're going to have a short video about this. And that will hopefully explain to you what the Local Area Fund is. So if we can be on standby with the tape, let's hear about it. A new £180,000 fund has been launched to help support community-led projects in every ward in the borough, helping to rebuild local areas and connect communities after the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. The £10,000 pot for each ward is intended to support local initiatives, helping launch new ideas and developing projects to make a positive difference to our borough. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a widespread impact on how we deliver services and support local people. We welcome all ideas on how to improve your local area, particularly those that aim to help rebuild our communities, connecting people and finding new ways of supporting each other. Any individual, local group, charity or business can submit an idea or apply for a grant. Applications need to demonstrate how the project meets one or more of the following priorities. Enable local people to develop, agree and deliver their own responses to local issues and build stronger communities. Make public places more attractive, enjoyable and distinctive. Support local initiatives that address the causes of climate change and minimise the environmental impact of carbon, waste and pollution to protect the future of our borough and our planet. Promote the vitality of our town and neighbourhood centres. Widen participation in sports and physical activity. Enhance the artistic and cultural offer and protect the borough's heritage. Improve health and well-being. Improve crime prevention. Improve community assets. Before you apply, you will need to 
discuss your idea with your ward councillor to see how it fits with local priorities. You can do this by sharing your idea online or contacting your ward councillors directly. And then, your idea will be reviewed by ward councillors and officers to recommend next steps for your idea. This may include an application to the local area fund, but could also include signposting you to another source of support or funding for your idea. If the idea is suitable for the local area fund, we will invite you to submit a formal application. Once a complete application has been submitted, it will then be reviewed and we'll let you know if it has been successful. We look forward to hearing from you. So there you are. Um, Councillor Jim Millard, by the way, that was the voiceover specialist there. So you can tell why he is the advertiser's first choice after Councillor Baldwin, of course, when it comes to doing voiceover work for adverts. Um, local area funds, £10,000 per ward. You might not think that is, that's particularly, you know, immense largesse, but when you consider that we have 18 wards, that works out as £180,000 a year, uh, which we're hoping to reinvest into our community. And of course, all of the other things such as Civic Pride will still go on. Um, the various Richmond uh, charity will still be continued doling out cash. So, but this is a, a small thing which we're hoping is going to, you know, give some interest to local um, organisations or individuals to do something specifically for your board. And um, now, unbeknown to me, uh, before we went into that video, uh, Councillor Newton Dunn joined us, and I know that he will want to give you his ward update because um, we've heard from uh, Pam and from Peter. Uh, but as we have a split ward, we do try to allow both parties to have a say. So, um, Councillor Newton Dunn, we are just looking to unmute you and fire away. Thank you. If, I don't know if you can hear me. Am I on air? You are on air. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. Well, in South Richmond Ward, we have three councillors, Pam Fleming, who you heard from, Peter Buckwell and me. And although we're different parties, we work extremely closely together. I'm not going to say anything else because Pam has spoken for the three of us and I'm delighted there are some real people here on the conversation and I know there's a great deal of anger that people want to talk about the riverside and the green and the violence and the drugs and so I want to stop now and hear what they say. Thank you, thank you Bill. Um, what we were talking about Bill before um, you joined us was that what we're going to do is try to get through non antisocial behaviour questions first, and then we will be able to spend the rest of the time doing stuff about Richmond Green, Richmond Riverside and stuff like that. Now I see uh, that we have got two, well we've got one question from Nick Coleman. Nick, I'll come back to you as the first one um, when we have the antisocial behaviour stuff. Um, Barry May, I'll I'm just going to unmute you now and you can let me know whether yours is a general or an antisocial behaviour question. And for everybody else, because I know it's a bit tricky because you're going to be writing questions and I won't be able to know who you sue. If it's a general question, write general question. And if it's just a, an antisocial behaviour question, write question. If that makes sense. So I think it's the only really way of doing this. So Barry May, are you there? Yes, I am, Gareth, and thank you very yes, much. Not um, at all. I have questions about ASB, but that will be for later. Yep. Uh, my, the, the question I want to ask now is this. How will you deal with the increasing number of change of use applications in Richmond Town Centre, from retail to mixed use, which often involve applications to sell alcohol in the evening. Thank you. I would be surprised if um, Councillor Fleming didn't have an answer uh, to this one with her vast experience in this matter. Um, well, it's going to be, I think, quite difficult because the government has made a number of changes. Um, that in fact will allow change of use from A1 to um, restaurant and mixed use. But when it comes to, to actually selling alcohol, then um, that will, they will require a license. So it will have to go, they will have to apply for a license, which is a different procedure. So that to some extent should uh, control the amount of shops that are actually selling alcohol. I, I would say that at the moment, and I have raised this um, with both officers and Paul Chadwick, who, who's actually on tonight, so he may be able to um, chip in on this. But I've asked about, because I know that the cumulative impact policy is due to come up for review. And I have asked about the process for this, because that will have an impact on the question of new applications for the sale, for the sale of alcohol. Um, but as for 
mixed use um, and change of use. We've got to remember, as I just said earlier, about the number of empty shops we've got. And we'll have to think very carefully about whether we really want to have an empty shop or a cafe. But I, I, I think it's going to, again, be increasingly difficult to fill these. Whereas before, when you didn't have a retail unit, the, the, an A1, cafes were jumping in. I'm not sure that that's going to be the case now. Um, but I hope, I hope, Barry, that that gives you some, some answer and perhaps Paul can give some uh, information on the cumulative impact policy. I, I've been tapping away on the ask to, ask to unmute button with Paul Chadwick, so hopefully he has. So, Paul, are you there? Paul Chadwick, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, is our, um, is our lead uh, officer in terms of the environment uh, director. So he's our director for the environment. Uh, Paul, are you there? Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, good stuff. Good evening. Uh, yeah, I thank, thanks for, for letting me in. Um, well, I haven't got an answer to your question of officers yet, uh, Pamela, uh, but it, sometimes, you know, you frame the question in a way that you hope gets the right answer, don't you? So I, I have every sympathy with you, the, 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 what you say about the cumulative impact policy. I think what we've seen recently in terms of ASB and, 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 and what's been going on the Green and the Riverside uh, adds impetus for the need for a quick review and one that one that favours uh, um, an approach to, to alcohol in the town that's, that's, um, that's appropriate uh, and, and tackles the issues we've got at the moment. In terms of planning, um, uh, I, I think the reality is that you're right, councillor, you, you split the issues in the right way. We are going to be relying more and more on, the, on our licensing policies rather than planning policies because in effect, government is saying on a lot of issues, free reign to to, uh, to, to shop owners, to developers, to not quite do exactly what they want, but there's very, very uh, little we can do about, for example, the change from A1 to A3 now. There's still a process, mind, that we've got to follow, but uh, the, the presumption is in favour of that change now. So, yeah, you're right. We've got to rely on more, more and more on licensing policies. And, and uh, go back to your point about cumulative impact policy, that will be really important. And, I am pushing offices, my colleagues, for, for an early review. Okay, thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, are there any other councillors who want to come in on this? I would just say uh, it is going to come down to very strong licensing, and I think that's the one thing that we're going to have to look at. Um, but I know that our licensing committee is very robust in their approach, and people are allowed to speak about that. So. Absolutely. That's where it will go. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Maureen, thank, Barry, does this answer your question? Uh, yes, I suppose it does. But I, I have, would like to ask, do you think it's still appropriate that these licensing matters are dealt with by Merton? Well, can by I Merton. answer? Oh, Paul. They're not, answered, they're not dealt with by Merton. But, but it, it really, I need to, I will, I will probably need to offline explain the arrangement. We have a shared arrangement with Merton. And Merton mm -hmm. of the employer organisation. It could just as easily have been Richmond who were the employer organisation. These are genuinely officers who, who work for, for us as a council to our instructions, to our policies. And, and, and I directly oversee those officers. So, yeah, technically they're Merton officers because Merton employed them, but really they are our officers. May I just. Yes, of course. Ch just chip in because um, uh, it, it is, a, it is a, joint, a joint service and it does have representatives. I, I used to, when I was cabinet member, sit, sit on the um, joint regulatory partnership and now um, the licensing chairman and um, Martin, uh, the, the vice chair of environment sit on it. So it, so it, it, it does have regular contact with Richmond, Richmond councillors um, and, and, and licensing itself, licensing committee, is completely sovereign and completely different. It still acts, it still operates from Richmond. Okay, thank you very much for all of that. Peter Bugwell, were you wanting to come in? I wasn't quite sure. Um, no, thank you. I, 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 I have nothing to add to um, what Pamela has already said. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for your question, Barry. We'll move on to Maureen Heffernan. Uh, Maureen, is your question related to the antisocial behaviour or is it general? Hi, um, it's a bit of both actually, um, okay. the point that Councillor Fleming made, um, and then on the last meeting there was much talk about Richmond getting a permanent police presence, 
Okay. Um, so it's not just obviously the antisocial behaviour, it's the crime in general that seems to have increased in the area. Um, and I know that um, in some areas, and particularly down by the riverside, that private security had started to be used and this was then actively discouraged. Um, but I'd like to know what movement, if any, has been made in, in looking for Richmond to get a permanent police presence. There were a number of suggestions made on the previous call and the fact that so many residents had said that they would be prepared to chip in financially or to help find a premises. Um, but there doesn't seem to have been any updates on that. And obviously, that we know this, it's not as straightforward as it might seem to be, but um, it would be good to understand if there has been any progress on that. Okay, who'd like to comment on this? Um, well, maybe the police want to mention it first, but after that, I would like to say something on it, please. Okay, so we have um, Rumi or Scott. Scott, you're muted, Scott, hang on. There we go. Thank you, Gareth, sorry. Um, I know it's come to my attention before, um, uh, not directly, I think it was discussed in the last one of these meetings, um, the, at, at present, there's no there's no concrete plans to have a, a permanent Richmond team, as it were. We, we're still having to remain with the, the the three wards we have, which is Kew North and South Richmond. Um, so far as plans in the future, there's there's discussions being held, but we are in the very very early stages, unfortunately. Um, and it's it's something that I I can't really comment too much about on, at, at this time. Um, but any movement on it, you guys will will be the first to know. Excellent. Thank you for that. Peter? Well, yes, of course, that, that, that's the, the answer to the question that we, we've been receiving all along. Um, we have for two years been asking for a, a town centre team for Richmond, in addition to our safer neighbourhood team, on the basis of the special requirements that Richmond has from the point of view of the visitor economy and the night economy. And um, we've asked for this time and time again. We've made speeches in um, council. We've written to uh, uh, Sally Benatar. Um, Gareth, you've written on our behalf. Um, we've spoken to the Safe and Neighbourhood team and uh, um, we've also had a, a session with Rebecca Robinson and we asked the same question. Richmond needs a dedicated town centre team in addition to its Safe and Neighbourhood team um, in order to, to um, cover the special requirements of Richmond. We continue to get told no. Um, um, uh, we won't accept that. We keep on going back on it um, because the deployment of uh, numbers and the deployment of the teams is all a matter for um, Mayor Khan and the Commissioner of Police for the Metropolitan Police and uh, the, the, the Borough Commander. Um, those are the three individuals who decide um, what the ward complements will be. It's not a government thing, um, it's, it's not a council thing, it's down to those three individuals. And we keep on asking for this. Um, we believe that Richmond needs a dedicated town centre team to manage the various problems that it has. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Uh, just in terms of the premises, of course, I, I've raised the issue after the meeting that we had with Sally Benatar, who went back to her um, estate skies and said, you know, even if it was going to be some sort of porter cabin style arrangement, this was discussed. And the, the response back, um, I understand, to Sally was, well, we just don't have anything like that. And Sally's very good response back was, but there are a bunch of residents on Richmond Green who aren't short of a bob or two who wouldn't mind chipping in to make something. So it, it is being looked at by the very highest levels within the borough in order to try to see whether something can be done. Unfortunately, whether it's police, whether it's council, whether it's national government, things like this always take out of a long time. And I appreciate that we would like swift, snappy reactions, but these things do, I'm afraid, more and take a, a bit longer than we would like. I do understand that, but obviously, yeah. you know, taking time doesn't help the people that no, live no. here and what we have to put up with. No, I know. Um, and I know that, that there was a newsletter that went out from the Residents Association around the Green saying, saying to actively discourage the private security. Um, is there not a way then of even working with the Security Industries Association and getting accredited security people to be around? Because it's really not acceptable. Um, that people that live around here feel threatened on, a, on an increasing basis, uh, given what's happened over COVID and the amount of people coming in from outside the borough. 
um, you know, we, the, there is a responsibility to keep us protected as well. Yeah. Um, and to yeah. say that we have no idea of when that's going to take place, despite the demand of the residents um, and the willingness to help finance that, um, what can we do to push that? Okay, I feel that that's sort of moving into the antisocial behaviour stuff, that bit. So I will try, if we can, to come back. So I'm, I'm sure the, uh, the, the issue of private security will arise during that chat. But if we can try and stick to the non-antisocial behaviour stuff for now, that'd be good. So thank you very much for your question. I'm going to go to Nick Wilmore next, who has a question about the Teddington footbridge. Hi there, yeah, I, um, I work in Teddington and live in Ham, but I just noticed that the footbridge is looking, it's looking pretty tired and it's a pretty iconic bit of architecture and, and structure. And I'm just slightly concerned that it's got to a stage now where there are bits of concrete missing from the columns, that it's gonna be one of those things that'll have to be closed down completely and take an awful lot of time to be fixed properly. Is, is there a long-term strategy for kind of managing the footbridge and, and, and keeping it open while those works can, uh, can take place? I, I know you're not all structural engineers, but I was just wondering <laughs> if there is something in place or are they sort of aware of you guys? Paul Chadwick, I think, is probably yes. going to be the best place to answer on this one. Mm. Hi, yes. Um, well, I'm a Teddington resident, actually, and I noticed exactly what you've noticed recently. So uh, only last week I've actually raised of our, we got a bridge engineer, um, and I raised of the bridge engineer, or of his AD anyway, a guy called Nick O'Donnell, what, what is our strategy around our, our bridges? What were we up to in terms of the priority order of the works that we do to the range of bridges in the borough? It, it was kind of uh, actually in, uh, off the back of there being a discussion about another bridge where I actually felt, well, that other bridge was probably not as high a priority as Tennington Lock Bridge, given what I've seen of it. So I'm very happy to follow what I've already asked through and get a reply to you. Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't recall who it was, but I'm sure we can, can make sure that happens. But uh, basically I'm saying, I agree with the concern. I've chased through with our engineers what, what works are required and by when, and uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll have an answer shortly. That, that okay. Is. Thank you. Not at all. Thanks for your question, Nick. We're going to go to Judith Colliver next, who has a general question about home base. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I know I'm jumping the gun a bit here, but um, being rather pessimistic, as I think quite a lot of us are, and thinking ahead that possibly this home base development will get, um, will, will get permission, um, we're obviously very concerned as local residents about issues such as parking, for instance, because the local streets will undoubtedly become targets for uh, visitor parking and so forth, e you know, even if the residents don't have cars. Um, I'm just wondering how easy might it be, uh, were that to happen, for there to be an increase in the hours of restricted parking, including possibly Sundays, for instance, which at the moment are unrestricted so that you know local residents don't get completely um you know swamped by um you know visitors and so forth to the home base development okay so who from uh, i think the north richmond team really would like to pick this one up sure shall i pick yeah this? richard Warren. Yeah. yes i mean well, i know that richard can talk about the home base thing but if you need help with the parking bit i'll i'll go because i'm on transfer Okay, so, for councillors to know, I will call you in. you want me to talk about that? So you go first, Richard. Okay, yes. Um, uh, you're quite right. I mean, this is, they call it a car-free development, but in reality, it's not a car-free development. The idea is that effectively they seek to use the surrounding streets as its own unofficial car park. Um, and yes, you, you could impose a CPZ. There is only one problem. That is, well, more than one problem, but one of those problems is that Manor Grove in the past has voted against having that. Um, so they really don't want to have one. Um, but yes, you, you, you make a good point and this is a problem, but I'll, I'll pass over to, to Nancy now so she can carry on with the... Yeah. Uh, well, I'm only gonna go on about it because I'm on the transport committee as well and CPZ come under what we do. There's a couple of things about that, Judith. One of the um, 
one of the things that the developer has to do is help pay for the consultations that will go out to all the neighboring streets. Now we've been trying hard to get them to include more streets in this consultation. They don't, they only want to do the obvious ones. We want them to go further afield, like where you are in Stanmore Gardens, for example. So there's that. How easy is it to do? Well, with the, what happens is that this will go out to consultation. The um, the neighborhood will get to say what it is they want to do. If they want to do it 24-7, they can do it 24-7. They can do any, and you'll be given options of the types of things you can do. But the thing that we feel is uniquely unfair is that this is being forced on you by this development happening and you're going to have to pay for this. And, and that's that we counselors are not particularly happy about that, that for those of you who like to have your weekends where it's free parking, so granny can come and visit or whatever, or are going to be put in a position where that's not really help um, going to happen any longer. But the consultations will happen in the, in the way that our other CP that consultations take place. We counselors will continue to fight with the developer to try to get them to consult in more streets and uh, we're to get as many mitigations as we can get. Okay, that's grand. Thank you. Are there any other counselors who wish to come in before yeah, I bring yeah, you yeah, back? Yeah, yeah, if I can just uh, uh, chop in on, on this card. Uh, um, while I understand why Judy is, is feeling a bit pessimistic about the chances of us. Uh, dissuading the mayor from approving this uh, particular application. We still think it's very, very important for people to give all of the different reasons as to why a development of this size involving 11 stories is completely inappropriate to a predominantly low rise area like Richmond. So I think we've got to keep on campaigning as hard as we can before the public, uh, before the meeting that Mayor Khan will, uh, will uh, chair in early October. Uh, I think one factor I think we've got to bear in mind is we're living in very strange times, aren't we? We know that we're heading for a major recession. Recession has just been declared in the last few days. So this developer might go ahead and get planning permission, but whether or not the development will actually be built, I think has to be a little bit in doubt. And I think it's very important that we in the community show a united opposition to this particular development so that if he's not certain about whether or not he wants to spend tens of millions of pounds in constructing this development and this is a developer who's only successfully built one other development at all in his history then I think we've got to keep on applying as much pressure as we can to indicate to him that he will not receive the support of the local community even if he gets the go-ahead from uh, from the Mayor of London. Okay thank you Richard. Um, Judith. Oh Peter Buckwell you want to come in? Well, well, just very, very quickly um, to support what uh, has, has, has just been said. You know, it's an appalling development and um, totally out of character with Richmond and will change the character of our uh, of, of, of Richmond considerably. Um, I hope everybody will um, go online to the mayor's consultation. And I hope there will be um, a, a big push um, at, the, at the, 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 the consultation meeting, which is going to be held uh, later on in the year, October, I believe, and that the council will put up a very convincing case as well. We do have to try and stop this. It, 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 I would go as far as saying it's going to be an awful development. It will change the character of this part of the borough entirely. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, Judith, last word to you. Well, no, thank you for that. Um, I agree with the, last, uh, with the last speaker. It, it is going to completely change our immediate local area here and much for the worse. And, um, you know, I just hope that we can persuade more people locally to actually write in and object, because I think that's the real thing at the moment, to get people to actually object. Okay, thank you very much for your points. Right, we're going to move now to a question from Vivian Harris. Um, general question about planning. Oh, there you are, Vivian. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there seems to be quite a change on the planning portal that uh, some of us are trying to object to a rather monstrous 24 metre high cypress tree on Old Deer Park on the conservation area. And since I think Tuesday, none of us have been able to see how many objections are actually lodged on the, the website. It was there, but it hasn't been there for the last uh, 48 hours. That's very odd. 
Um, does anybody know what's happening with the... But what we can do, Vivian, is we can find out for you and come back to you to let you know how many objections have been lodged. How's that? Thank you. I have been asking for 48 hours and no one responds, so I'd be delighted. Who do you ask, Vivian? Well, I phoned up and I was told to send a message to the technical hub, who I sent three messages to and they didn't respond. And then subsequently I responded to the um, senior planning officers and all I got back was that I shouldn't have submitted my email objection that way and no response on why you can't see the number of objections on the uh, planning portal now. So hopefully that's not a change of policy. Oh. Uh, on the planning website. I don't think so. Paul Chadwick is sort of gesturing. Been, no, there's been no change of policy, no, no. not that I'm aware of. Um, but but uh, no. just send me your uh, note, Vivian. Copy, copy it to me and I'll get a reply off to yeah. you. I'll make sure you get a reply tomorrow. Oh, Vivian's muted. Hang on. <laughs> just a moment. There we go. Okay, folks, what I would suggest is that um, if you're ever in a situation like this uh, uh, that Vivian has found herself in, and I would probably speak for all three group leaders on the council, to get in touch with your local councillors, because really this is the sort of thing that they are there to help you with. So it doesn't matter which party it is, use your local councillors, because that's what they're for. Um, let me see, so Vives Hansen has a question about illegal parking on the Riverside. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I have for the last four years been battling uh, about the illegal parking on uh, of lots of cars and motorbikes on the riverside. So both sides of Richmond Bridge, so towards tides and the other side towards the boatyard people. And there was an a email sent out on the 10th of March that you were going to be implemented a restricted parking zone for illegal parking on the riverside. And it was going to be implemented on the 25th of May. Now, obviously, COVID then then happened. But I have been asking and emailing uh, about what the situation is on this, and I don't get any replies. Okay, so which of the... <laughs> I think, I think, Chadwick, I think, you, if you wish to answer the questions, you must thank okay. the council. Well, I think Peter, Peter Buckwell... Peter Buckwell knows all about this, yeah. and then we will let Paul yeah. in as well. Okay, are you going to let Paul talk first, or shall I go? you talk first, Peter. We've heard enough. Okay, yes. Well, <laughs> We've been battling to, um, uh, to put a traffic order in place um, along the riverside so that we can control the parking there. Um, we, we were promised and we were given a timetable for putting in this into place at the beginning of the year. And um, we were hopeful that it was going to be completed by May. Um, COVID intervened mm -hmm. and there's been a delay to that. But I'm told that the, the signs are now being um, prepared to go up to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, indicate that, um, um, uh, uh, that parking is controlled along there. And we hope to have the, um, um, the experimental traffic order on which it's being, under which it's being done in place in about six weeks. That's the current position. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And now we go, to, we go from Peter to Paul. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Peter, summed it yeah. up. I, I literally have just signed off a uh, um, uh, uh, delegate powers report on this. But, but I'm pretty sure Peter's uh, bang on in terms of the, the timetable. But uh, yeah, the debate, the delay was clearly COVID related. We had other things I'm afraid to do. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you very much, everybody, for those. I'm going to just, the last general question I'm going to take um, is Stephen Speaks one about Q Road. So we're not going to do that just yet. We've got a few questions to get through. So um, if we can make it brisk and snappy, please. Everybody that's questioners and question answers. Um, Ruth Steinholtz has a question about cycling. So um, Richmond is obviously the center of uh, cycling, both all, lots of us local people, but also people coming through to go to Richmond Park and other places. But for years and years now, we've had this very dangerous, narrow, quote unquote, cycle lane along Church Road behind the station, uh, which is not fit for purpose and causes cyclists in order to stay safe to go in the middle of the road. The um, church road itself, the upper part of it, is full of potholes. So if you want to cycle safely, you have to weave along. Um, and there, uh, the 
uh, shall we say, I'm both a driver and a cyclist and a walker, so I see this from all um, points of view, but the um, driver in sort of compliance with with the road um, safety rules is pretty poor. Uh, people several times a day run the red light on Sheen Road and Church Road, and I've been told that the police don't really care about that. One day somebody's gonna get killed there. Um, I, I just think, you know, we're trying to minimize obesity, we want to lower pollution. We have all of these aims, but the easy low hanging fruit that we could be tackling, um, you know, more cycling, parking, et cetera, it just doesn't really seem to be getting the attention. Uh, and I'd like to know what we're going to be doing about that. Okay, think, thank you very much, Ruth. This, uh, I think this falls, which ward does this fall within? South Richmond or North Richmond? It's First Street. Church it's Road, South Richmond issue path. It's South. Well, actually, I—I I mean, I, I was on a limited response, really, in that, um, firstly, it, it is the surface of it is appalling, and I have been in touch with officers, and it's certainly not on the schedule. Is I think the best hope is in about another eighteen months or two years before um, it's it's likely to be resurfaced. Um, it is it is very narrow. I'm. Uh, and, and the point Ruth makes about that running that red light there, it is incredibly dangerous. And I flagged it up on a number of occasions and asked for a camera to be put there to see if we could we could monitor it. As regards to the cycle lane, I'm, I'm really not quite sure how one can improve that um, without removing the parking. And I, again, I'm not sure how popular that would be with, with residents because it's, a, it, it's, it's in an area where there's very limited limited parking, so I do regard that as a problem, and I'm 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 very sympathetic, but I'm I'm not sure how we have been looking as part of the town centre sort of working team, and Peter may want to say something about this as well. Um, and Church Road is one of the roads that have been um, has has been looked at, uh, but I'm not sure that it's going to become that that's come going to transport committee in September, but I'm not sure that any changes have actually been put forward for Church Road. So not okay. a very optimistic reply. Okay, Peter Bookwell. Um, no, I don't have anything to add on that, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your question, Ruth. It's on their radar. I'm sure that um, you have good councillors who will be plugging away at it on your behalf. Uh, we've got a question here from Col Colin Duffy um, about EV charging points on residential streets. Oh, are you there? Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to ask, uh, are there any plans to install more EV charging points? Very difficult areas? to hear you, Colin. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yeah, try shouting. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to know, were there any plans to install more EV charging points uh, in Richmond residential streets? Any particular area? Uh, well, uh, North Richmond. North Richmond, okay. Well, let's have one person from North and one person from South. So, EV charging points, are you aware of any plans? Richard Pine, Richard Warren or Nancy? Well, I, I think we've got, last time I counted, I think we've got about 25 charging points in different parts of our ward. Um, that seems to be about the right number that's required at the present time. And when I look at them, they are used regularly but I don't think at the moment we need more than that. Uh, but if we do, then we, we've got a number of, you know, of, uh, of larger, wider roads so we could, uh, we could put them in. Um, we're very sympathetic to the idea as a council. We absolutely want to encourage uh, uh, electric vehicles. And um, so I, I don't think at the moment it's a problem. Okay, um, anyone? Nancy? <laughs> As I'm on the transport committee, I know that we are trying very hard to get as many EV points as possible. And some of the things that we're looking at and that people can apply for if they like, is to have the, the, uh, the street lamps that are near their homes converted so that you can do some charging there as well. So um, as requests come in, as things are necessary, um, we, will be, we are looking at that, but that is something that the transport committee is actively looking at. So. Okay, would any other councillor like to come in? It's on the list, effectively, Colin, is the, is the broad point. Um, if there are specific points that you would like to see a charging point at, can you 
um, just get in touch with your local councillor is what I would suggest. So we're going to, the last two questions are slightly interlinked, I should imagine. So we're going to take Martin Anderson first, and then we're going to bring in Stephen Speak, because they're both about the Q Road. So I imagine that um, they're both about the same subject. So Martin Anderson first, and then we're going to take in Stephen Speak. And... Good evening. Thank you very much. No store. The, I, I understand entirely why the okay. barriers were put in in George Street. Uh, when uh, people had to queue, there were lengthy queues during limited access to shops. Um, uh, I haven't seen any need for those barriers in George Street now for many weeks, and I wonder why they're still there. Can I also ask about the Q Road? Yes. Uh, having lived here for uh, a very, very long time, uh, I've, I've noticed that access to um, Kew Gardens by coach and by car uh, tends to rely on the parking availability along Kew Road, which is now impossible uh, because of those barriers. Uh, is there any reason why those barriers are still there? Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Now we're going to whip round to find Stephen Speak, who is going to ask his question and we'll get them both answered together. Thanks, Chair. It, it does follow very much onto that. And, and the question really is, why will Council not formally consult residents regarding the removal of parking on Kew Road? Now, I understand why it was done as a result of COVID, um, but it's perfectly possible now to collect um, views of residents. And instead, we've been asked to give our views on a CPZ to increase the hours um, in the area. It all seems very, very vindictive towards Kew Gardens, who are now asking for donations from the public. And uh, as I say, there is no reason why residents can't be asked to give their views. Okay, so who wants to come in on um, Kew Gardens? Uh, Nancy Bolton, I see gesturing. Um, okay. Many of the plans that the Transport Committee had were um, forced to go forward quicker because of the COVID crisis. So for example, that area that has the barriers now near Kew Gardens, that was always earmarked for a change so that there would be more active uh, travel that was happening along that. And there was consultation that went along with that. The end of that consultation got truncated. It was, it was begun, <laughs> Stephen, it was begun. But, that got truncated and it didn't get finished. And you're absolutely right. It didn't happen properly in the way that it should because the government forced us to go forward with making active travel possible there. But there were always plans to do something in that area. And we will go back and there will be consultations and there will be stuff like that. And I know that what you're saying about the CPZs, um, because we are now stuck with this diktat from central government telling us that we have to have uh, joined up thinking in terms of cycle lanes with and the Q Garden, uh, the Q Road ones. Um, it links up with, I forget exactly which cycle route it le links up with over the other side of Q Bridge and going into central London. So that's why we're, it hasn't been ideal, and I'm not going to pretend that it was, but it is part of something that we were looking at anyway. Um, am I right in thinking that there was some question about what's happening with the buses and everything, and people visiting? Uh, coaches. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And keep it short, because people are agitating will, to I, talk about ASP. I will, keep, I will keep it short. And in terms of that, we had already... Okay, there were already arrangements made. So Kew Gardens has a, a car park where they can do these things in. There has also always been a plan for drop off at Kew Gardens and then the uh, buses can go and park at Old Deer Park Garden. And then when it's time to pick up their people, they go back and they pick them up there. Um, so in terms of that, that was already pretty much in play. I hear what you're saying about regular visitors not being able to park just outside anymore. And 
you know, I get it, but something had to give. And I'm afraid that was what had to give. It was free parking for people who were going to be visiting the gardens anyway. And we feel that, you know, we, we have to do what the government asks us to do in terms of active travel. And that, that was the choice we had to make. But I hear what you're saying about it. it's not as easy now. Okay, uh, just on your question, Mr. Wilmore, regarding the barriers which are still in place in central Richmond, um, we can find that out for you about what the timescales are going to be on that. We can let the ward councillors know and um, they can start disseminating that information amongst their local residents. Okay, that was the general slot for questions. And we didn't do too badly in terms of time. What I will do is I will give us an extra four minutes on the end uh, to ensure that we can. Uh, be there. So I'm going to go right back up to the top of my sheet. Again, please don't write big long screeds in the text because I miss people's questions. Uh, Nick Coleman, Nick Coleman, you were the first first uh, cab off the rank at the very beginning with your question. So, uh, Councillor Roberts, thank you very much yeah, hello. for uh, coming in here. I don't know if you recall that uh, on the 22nd of June outside the cricketers, yeah. A number of residents around the Green uh, met with Councillor Newton Dunn and the Mayor expecting to have a, um, a session on antisocial behaviour, which was by then already several weeks through cooking up. And you showed up with uh, some of your um, staff, and so it became a more substantial, substantive event. Um, and at that moment, I think you took the lead on this Council's response to the widespread violence, drug dealing, gross antisocial behaviour, uh, defecation, urination, later, and now racing round the green, for example, but all of this occurring on the green and riverside. Well, it's uh, eight weeks plus in now. I wondered if you were confident that you brought it all under control. No, not in the least, um, is to answer the question. But what we have been doing is trying the, within the limited resources, and, the, and I'll bring the police in on this as well. Uh, first and foremost, I didn't turn up with any staff. Uh, the staff were already there because what was supposed to be happening was a was a quick tour around the businesses for the mayor uh, to go and see how they were coping during lockdown, but the event rather changed. Uh, so when I heard that there were going to be residents who wanted to you know, put their concerns to the council, I turned up, um, but it was just me. Um, the, the, the staff were there to escort the mayor, I'm quite right too. Uh, but no, we of course we've not got it this fully under control, but we have been doing what we can with the resources that we've got. And what we've been doing largely from the council is, is uh, by increasing um, the presence of our park guard over the last um, however many weeks. And I've got some figures here because people have been asking about how much we've increased park guard. Normal officer hours are an average of 67 a week, the park guard. Um, since that meeting and since the, um, the Zooms that we did, we've uh, increased that by an additional 144 hours a week of park guard. So that's four additional security officers Friday to Sunday, week in, week out. Uh, by the time we get rattled around to the um, August bank holiday, that will equate to an additional 720 hours of park guard, which is all being funded by the council. And that will be equivalent of 18,000 quid plus the VAT. Of course, we can claim that back. But 18, 000, so 20,000 pounds just in about a month or two. Um, specifically to deal with the issues of antisocial behaviour. I know that more um, police have been put on. I know that from speaking to Inspector Rebecca Robinson that we've had more than our fair share, particularly on Richmond Green, of the um, CCTV uh, footage camera. Uh, but we are trying to do more and more and more with what, as I say, with the limited resources and powers we have. And the dialogue keeps on going. And that's the most important thing for me is that we keep talking to residents and trying to respond to their to what they want us to do, and I'm sure the police would be in favour of that approach. Just do I, would either Scott or Rumi like to come in on this? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I think the same problem is being felt across both the council and the police at present, and that's resources. Um, since uh, we, since before we even came out of um, lockdown. Um, we, we've had a, a plan in place for the anticipated rise in, in antisocial behaviour just through the, uh, the, the vastly increased usage of open spaces um, as per the government advice. Um, we've had, I, I've been paying, paying officers over time to stay on longer, uh, work longer shifts. The, the money has to come from somewhere, of course. So, so I've been, been bidding and bidding and bidding at every occasion to try and get 
uh, some more money, some more resources to the area. Um, it's unfortunately an unprecedented problem. It's an unprecedented demand. It's something we've we've never seen. Um, a lot of these issues that we're seeing um, would would be dealt with in house or they'd be regulated if they were in a public house or a club. Um, it's it's just vastly vastly more difficult because um, it's not just Richmond where it's happening. Of course, it's happening across the whole of the Met. Um, so, but we are, I'm constantly reviewing the, um, the, the policing plan. I'll have one in for every weekend um, and, it, and it's just getting the, getting the resources there and getting the money available to, so that we can get down there and tackle the issues. Um, Councillor yeah, Roberts, can I? Are we done that? Are you finished, Scott? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. By all means, yeah. go on. Just yes, of course, two, Nick. Go on. Two go quick responses on yes, this. Yes, of course. Okay, if I could. Uh, one is, um, you said the most important thing is the dialogue with the uh, residents, I'd suggest the most important thing is actually reducing or stopping all of these incidents. It's going to be about results. Okay, uh, I'll take that one on the chin. Go on. The second thing is, uh, you talk about, a lot about the parks, the Cholde Park Guard. Uh, the residents around the Green have seen no parks patrol or parks guard for the last fortnight. But I will bring Paul Chadwick in, who is our Director of the Environment, who has responsibility for this, because one of the things that we always get told is we don't see people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that unless you're standing outside your window looking. So, Paul oh, oh, Chadwick. Well, well they, they have been there, and um, I've seen them there in the last two weeks. I go regularly, um, and uh, I think I haven't actually got the, the, the record of their attendance in my hand. I think you might have it, Gareth, actually. But, I do. Uh, we get reports through of their weekend attendance that are pretty detailed and um, the, 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 the attendance for last Friday example shows multiple uh, uh, attendance and incidents sadly of course at Richmond Green and Richmond Riverside they are busy they are stretched they are um, great officers but they, they, they are certainly there okay I'll tell you precisely what I've got here so uh, this is the um, report for the 7th of August and this covers the period four o'clock in the afternoon until one o'clock in the morning. And it starts off with various other places around the borough, which are lower priority that they went and visited. Um, arriving Richmond Riverside at 2002, with a very detailed um, description of what went on on the Riverside. Then moving into Richmond Green and doing a patrol and giving a detailed account there. Then Old Deer Park. Uh, giving a detailed patrol there, then back through the green and back to Richmond Riverside. So they arrived 2002 and departed 2338. So they spent a good four hours in the local, well, nearly four hours in the local area. So I'm afraid I do take issue when, you know, when we have the facts, when we have the data of the patrols, that, there are not, that they're not there and that we are not putting in the additional resource, which I've also heard, you know, that the additional resource has been quite substantial. 18,000 pounds, as I say, 720 man hours over the over roughly two months it, in order to try to get this under control. So you may disagree that it's there, I don't. Can, can I just come in, councillor? Yes, of course, Rumi. Uh, um, in relation to the park guards, um, they're, they're doing a terrific job. And yes, they have been there every weekend because I've seen them there. Um, and I, I, I can go on record and say that, and they are working with us um, in partnership, you know, to bring this problem to a, a, a manageable kind of situation. Um, like you said, this is a, an unprecedented time. We've never seen anything like this before. People gathering in Riverside and the Green, I've never seen that before. But in terms of, we haven't got a town centre um, team as such it's not solely down to us to bring a town centre team in place however with what we're doing is we're looking at the numbers of antisocial behaviour and, and the crime we are aware <clears throat> we are uplifting uh, police resources every weekend as much as we can with what we've got and, and it's about for me um, two bits really volume of antisocial behaviour versus the risk of harm and violent injury and violent crime and violent crime, I'm sure Scott's got some statistics, has gone down since last year. And this year's halved. Um, and I'm aware because I'm down there every weekend with the troops. And in terms of we are providing a presence there, 
We're trying to contain a large volume of people with small numbers of police officers. And I think I've been with you, haven't I, um, on patrol yeah. uh, with Rebecca. And I, I don't know what you, you know, want to, if you want to feed back on that. It, it, it seems a lot worse than what it is sometimes. But no doubt there are things going on, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. But we are, I think, with what we have, I think we're managing fairly well. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Rumi. Okay, so we're going to go now to Nick Saunders, who has a question about um, graffiti on the old palace wall. No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't get involved. I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, interrupt this dialogue at the moment. Let's just keep going on the ASB stuff because this is the this is the key uh, subject of the evening. Okay, we'll move on to somebody else. Let me see. So who have we got now? So, oh, Nancy Baldwin's wanting me to unmute. Hang on a moment. Oh, you're no, unmuted, Nancy. No, that's okay. We're good. My internet went kablooey. We're good. Oh, okay. You got something about leaf blow. So HSK. Who's HSK? So we live in uh, on the Richmond Green, and we do find, con you're, if you're um, not having enough resources. Some of the residents, I think we, we did have a, a, a private uh, security guard. When we left, one time we lived in Kensington, they weren't going to intrude, but just having enough presence on Richmond Green, which doesn't have any lighting at nighttime, there should be either some lights on the green or there should be some CCTV on the green. There should be something which can record problems. What's the, you know, if the resource isn't there, then some of us are willing to put in a bit of extra resource. Why are you stopping us? Well, no, nobody's stopping you, sir. Um, if, as, as was made quite clear in the letter, if you, sorry, I'm talking a lot, it should be really the World Council. Um, if you wish to employ um, private security mm -hmm. to protect your property, mm -hmm. then you are entitled so to do. I think what the concern is that we did have an individual who was neither hired, contracted, nor employed by anybody um, uh, related to Richmond Green, who started, um, it, it would appear, I don't wish to speak too much as it's an ongoing investigation, uh, to take the law into their own hands. Uh, but councillors Buckwell, Newton, Dunn or Fleming may have a point on... I, I, sorry, yeah. I wanted to add, as the police are here as well, that we do have, and they may not be ideal, but they would certainly act as a deterrent. We do have the rapid response and mobile CCTV cameras. Um, and I would have thought that even though the lighting isn't that good, and when that, that's a separate issue that when the LED lighting um, is it eventually installed there, that will improve. But I would have thought it would be worth the police applying for the use of, because I think the, the, the form is that they have, the police have to apply to the council but we bought, actually, the three ward councillors bought um, two rapid response cameras with the Peter Rabbit filming money. And I would have thought at least it's worth trying to see if they can act as some form of deterrent, even if, in fact, the footage isn't as good as it might be. I do have another point. If I, can you hear me? Yes, of course, sir. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, bloody hell, I nearly... Oh, I forget. No, Sorry. All right. I'll come back to you in a second. Yes, of course, not a problem at all. Uh, Peter Buckwell, would you like to... Uh... Um, uh, just a point, yes. Um, um, the uh, the <clears throat> private security guards that were employed in the way that they were was very unfortunate. Um, you know, uh, they, they became vigilantes, unfortunately. Um, um, and um, they, they did have to be stopped. And as you say, there's nothing stopping individuals employing um, private security guards to guard their own property. Um, uh, I, I, th I, think, I think that's done, but as many um, residents said to me, it's all very well standing these people down, but basically the police aren't defending us, they're not looking after us properly, and that was the reason why um, some of them felt the necessity for bringing in private security guards. They felt that the police weren't protecting them properly. Okay, Bill, I saw you had your hand up. Yes, thank you very much, Gareth. The, the problem is the park guard are doing a great job, but there's only two of them, and they both basically stick in their car. We have no criticism of them. We wish there were many more, but there aren't. The police turn up from time to time, and Rumi, thank you very much for that. But if you live on the green or in the neighbourhood, what you 
actually see is the miscreants, the people misbehaving, see the police, calm down when they're there, and as soon as the police have gone, the bad behaviour starts again. So we don't just need a short appearance. Thank you very much. We've driven around the green. The dealers and everybody else are at it all the time, and they're very clever. And what we want is a permanent presence, watching or cameras of time. So it's not good enough just to come and then to go again. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, sir, you were you had your hello. There you are. You're not you're not muted. Right. Um, I just remembered. So when one did see some incidents over the weekend, I rang one one one. It went to uh, an answering machine. Said email. There was there was no response. One tried to put the uh, email in. There was there was no actual record of it. Record of it even. It was almost. Then I asked one of some, one of our other neighbours, shall one ring 999? To ring 999 seemed a bit overzealous, but is that what we should do next time? Rumi Scott, what should, in which circumstances should 999 be used? What, what was the incident? Sorry, what, what, was, what actually occurred, sir? There was drug dealing going on outside our house. There was a, a, a couple of other cars. There were quite a lot of young men, um, and it was blatantly obvious that they were actually uh, it was very late at night, 12-ish, and they were dealing drugs. How, how do you know they were dealing drugs, sir? Um, I could see them from my window. There were some other people turning up. Okay. I don't, I mean, I don't take drugs myself, but they were exchanged, they were coming and going, and it doesn't okay. normally ever happen here, on a weekday. But the weekend, when it was a very warm day, it was outside our house, um, where there is no parking, actually. There shouldn't even be parking on that part. A car was parked, there's four people in the car, lights are on, music is on. It's like a beacon, you know, if you want to come here, come here, two minutes, somebody else arrives and they're gone again. And this is late at night, there's no, the police, if they were only here for five minutes, three minutes, they won't see this. You have to have somebody there much longer term or CCTV if that's the case. I mean, well, I can't put, if I was to turn my CCT cameras on my house onto the green, I don't think I'm allowed to do that, am I? Well, it's why I'd say, sir, in regards to, to who you should call at that particular time. I'd say crime happening now, ring 999. Okay. Crime, you think a crime is about to happen, ring 999. Okay. If a crime has happened uh, and it's done and, and there's, the suspect is no longer present and there's no one injured, then that's, that's the case for 101 or an online report. Okay, so if it's um, happening now or it's about to happen, one will ring 999. Absolutely. So yeah. It's literally, tw you know, 20 yards outside my house or less than that even. Yeah, 999 in that circumstance, absolutely. Okay, well, it's good to know. Good, good. Thank you so much for your help. Um, anybody from the councillor team wishing to just quickly come in, I'll then move to our next question, uh, which is, well, this is not so much a... Uh, Maureen Heffernan. Oh no, sorry, Vivian Harris. I do apologise, Vivian. Um, as I've said many times, if you write lots of stuff in the chat, I miss people. Vivian Harris. Thank you. Um, I know I've said it before, but I am going to say it again. The residents of the Riverside and the Green are intimidated, threatened, scared, and quite a few of them are now sleep deprived. You know, to have a car parked on the yellow lines outside your house, blaring out music till one or two o'clock in the morning, and you call and you report it and nothing happens, and, and you're just getting absolutely fed up with a lack of response. Now, there was one particular incident, and I won't go into too many of the details, but the residents that were kept awake by this loud music, did call 101, did get some support. The police were there for 10 minutes, they then left. And what happened? The car left, came back again half an hour later. Um, music was just as loud. And then finally, about one o'clock in the morning, same car was doing handbrake turns on the green itself. Um, call back to 101, no response. I just, you know, I know these are exceptional times, but I think if we just need a bit more of coverage and resources. Personally, and I'm sure you've got the statistics to prove me wrong, we have much better response in terms of police resources and park guard resources at the end of June, the beginning of July, than we've had for the last two weeks. So we sort of feel that since we got the residents' letter saying, 
you would help us and you would combat the crime. We feel we're worse off now than we were at the beginning of, of July because we just haven't seen any action. And frankly, either the sort of attitude of these people that are determined to make trouble are just saying, well, you know, there's no arrests, there's no fines. You know, we can see the police when they're coming because we've always got good vantage points. We'll just leave it for a bit and come back later on because we seem to be able to get away with doing almost what we want on the green and the riverside. The Friday night incident was dreadful. We had motorbikes using Water Lane as a racetrack. And then there was the very serious stabbing outside Revolution at, I believe, two o'clock in the morning. Now, I understand the young man has survived, but apparently it was all touch and go. So we are, we are threatened, intimidated, scared, and frankly, quite a few of us are sleep deprived. Okay, thank you, Vivian. I'm not here to be answering the questions, but if anybody wishes to jump in. Oh, I don't mind jumping in again. Um, oh. I, I know it has been, it probably has been noticeably not, not as, um, as well policed as it has been um, in the last two weeks. Un unfortunately, um, where I've been obviously bidding for more and more resources, um, I, I haven't had them as much as I'd like it within the last two weeks. Um, we have a, a sort of ever ever growing central um, aid demand um, in the lead up to Nottingham Carnival weekend, or what would have been Nottingham Carnival weekend, especially. Um, what we do have, um, and what I've been trying to get diverted and tasked to the area as much as I can, is um, we have um, something called Operation Menorca, uh, which is effectively the, the the policing response towards the the, the COVID levels of ASB um, gatherings, unlicensed music events. Um, but they are essentially task resource, unfortunately. They're, they're not dedicated to Richmond, they're dedicated to Southwest. So where, where I can, and, and I have got some this weekend um, and the following weekend, um, people sort of dedicated to Richmond. Um, some, some colleagues from the, the, they're called the Violence Suppression Unit uh, and the tasking team, um, they, they will be on hand to help out this weekend and next. Um, but, but it has been a struggle. Um, I, I know, I think the, some of the Operation Menorca um, officers came down, I think it was last Friday, um, uh, or the Friday before, clearing the riverside. Um, so, so, but, but they, are, they are sort of tasked to, to the whole of the, 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 the southwest. It's, they, they can't stick around in one place for too long. It's deal with something there, move on to the next area, which I know is, is not perfect, but it's, it's what we have at the moment, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, I am uh, constantly on the case, constantly trying to get more and more people to, to police Richmond. Um, I'm very passionate about it, as all of you are. Um, it, it's, it's, it's the area that I look after. So, yeah, I, I am doing my utmost to try and make it work. Thank you, Scott. Um, just can, I, 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 can I just, sorry, can I just sort of chip in? Yes, of course, Pam. Yes, hello. Yeah. No, because I want to say that, you know, I know Scott and I know our whole Safe and Able team are doing their absolute utmost to, to, uh, to, to help on this. Um, and nobody, but nobody is criticising them. Um, I, I just think that one of the things that I know a previous uh, sergeant we had in the town for several years always said was that if you had a very visible police, police presence round about sort of seven o'clock in the evening, it tended at that time... To, to deter some of the people, some of the worst people, people who were beginning to get drunk at that stage or coming in to make trouble. Now, I, I don't know whether there is a presence at that sort of time or not, but I, 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 you know, I, ju I just feel everything has to be tried because it's clearly a, a totally unacceptable situation for the residents of both the, the, the Green and the, and the Riverside. And certainly over those years when he was sergeant, was he, when he was sergeant, it, it, it really did help to control. And I think probably other people on this call will agree that there have been in the past huge problems on Richmond Green and that over that period, um, things were a lot quieter. Well, a lot quieter. I mean, there are, there are always going to be issues on, on Richmond Green. Young people love to go there. But um, I'm, I'm just pointing that out. Can I just come in there? Uh, yes, of course, um, so, yes, so when, Pamela, when you're talking about the sergeant that was there with the resourcing that he had, he had a, a, a rather large resourcing pool to play yeah. uh, with at that time, because I know exactly how many people he had then. Um, then and now, in terms of our resourcing picture, 
it's a huge, huge, you know, difference. We have, you know, it wasn't our idea to make Richmond into two police, you know, officers and that's it. We'd rather have a town centre team if we had the resources, we'd have it, you know, it's not up to us. Um, we have what we have, but um, like Scott's saying, we are doing what we can in terms of uplifting the DWOs, the dedicated ward officers, with officers from other departments to bring them in. But like the, 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 the BCU, as we call it now, it's, it's a quad borough, you know, borough, and demand is, is rife everywhere. And they're literally running around from place to place, place to place, and that's how it's working. Um, and it's all down to the risk of harm and, you know, and threat of harm. And that's what we're, you know, but yes, for the next two, three weeks, Scott and I have devised a plan uh, until two, three in the morning uh, with police officers, park guard and officers from other um, departments that from the violence suppression unit. So hopefully things will be uh, rather more under control, uh, touch wood this uh, weekend and the next two weekends. Yeah. I'm not criticising you at all. I mean, I understand the problem. Yeah, yeah it's just, I'm just saying that. the resources is just, just literally just not there, but we are trying with what we have. Okay, we're going to go to Maureen Heffernan next. Whilst we um, unmute her, um, Ollie, yes, I'm here to answer questions. However, the, the idea of these events is to hear from your elected ward councillors. It's, it's really not, we used to have a, a series of meetings where you only got the cabinet coming along. This is for you to put questions directly to your ward councillors. And I'm just here as the, you would normally have an independent chair, to be honest. Uh, but it's because of all this whole COVID thing that they've, they've got me doing it. So it's not that I don't want to answer questions, and I'm happy to answer questions, it's that really the people that are here to answer the questions are the ward councillors. So Maureen, have it. Hi, sorry it's me again. But, That's right. Uh, <laughs> sorry it's me again. I, I, I say that nearly 10 times a day. Sorry it's me again. But go on. Um, yeah, it was really about, uh, again, last time we were on the call, there was um, concern about the way supermarkets were stocked by the alcohol at the points of entry um which obviously with this great weather um nobody begrudges anybody a drink to take to the green but there was clearly no control on uh, on this activity and that still seems to be the case i mean even i was in waitrose yesterday and their whole front counter which is food to go was just full of alcohol and you had to go and hunt out the food around the other side and it's just you know these are these are all big supermarket chains that have a corporate social responsibility within their communities and there was talk last time um because both sainsbury's and tesco were on the call um saying that they would adjust their practices um and uh, it doesn't seem to have been the case and again you know what action if any is being taken to get these these big corporations to respect our community and to put some controls in place. Okay, so any of the ward councillors wish to jump in on the on the supermarkets? I do have an update on. I know I just said Ollie, it wasn't me doing the talking, but I do, I do have some information on this. If any of the ward councillors are keen to speak about alcohol provision by the supermarkets. No. no, tell us, tell us the update. I mean, other okay. than saying <laughs> this is hot off the press. This is really hot off the press. I mean, first and foremost, there was some. Um, there was a very welcome set from Sainsbury's, who uh, refused. Who are now until the end of um, August have got a ban in place on the sale of alcohol after nine o'clock, which is what was asked for at that meeting. A ban on the sale of alcohol after nine o'clock at both their Twickenham stores and their Richmond stores, and they kept. For, for reasons of um, competition law, they came up with that idea all by themselves. Similarly, today, coming up with the idea all by themselves, um, my licensing uh, lead, uh, Nick Stevens, has been in touch with Tesco uh, regarding a range of measures which they are hoping to put in place. Um, I can't go into too much detail about it now because frankly, I've not had a chance to read the email. It came through at 25 past six and then we kicked off this one at 6.30. So I've not been able to see too much of the detail, but there do appear to be some promising moves coming our way from Tesco. I had an email from the, um, the retail manager for Marks & Spencer, who was also on the original call, and um, she said that they close at you know, five o'clock anyway, and that their alcohol um, 
retail offer is hardly um, the sort of, the, it's, not, it's not your blue wicked and your Smirnoff ices in 24 boxes. So they, they feel that they're fairly co confident that they're not adding to the, to the situation. But we will be hoping to make some announcement tomorrow about what Tesco are offering. But the, the, on, the, the dialogue with supermarkets has been ongoing even right up until the time that this meeting started today. So we are looking at the supermarkets very, very closely. Peterborough Smith. And I think that's just somebody who's down as Peter. Here. I know who, there you go. Oh, no, you're muted, Peter. Hang on. Sorry? There you go. Sorry. You can hear me. Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm with the Safer Neighbourhood Board. I'm a joint chair along with Wendy Carl Pope, who you know, and oh, Carol yes, Atkinson. Just to say, we have been working on with them. Um, uh, the South Richmond PLG, we're, we're setting up a working group uh, with a lot of the people here to try and address and try and pull together and support the people on Richmond Green and the Riverside to tackle these issues. Nothing new to add, your, your Tesco news is really welcome, but to try and coordinate everything, working with the councillors, working with, we've got David Allister on the panel and, and, and Scott's with us. Uh, and uh, you know, seeing if we can support you and pull everything together in this very difficult situation. Thank you. Okay, the rather depressing news is that there is an ongoing police operation as we speak um, on Richmond Green, uh, three police cars and an ambulance involved uh, by the Prince's Head, uh, for those of you who wish the details. Um, so I'm just, uh, Phyllis and Suki have questions. We're just trying to see if you're still on the call. You've not put your hand up by any chance. Ah, there you go. Told you not to raise your hands. There we are. We found you. Yeah, hi. Good evening. Sorry, I'm a bit Hello. late. I'm just coming back from work. Um, about the resources, just walking past the A316, I've got a couple of points to raise here. Uh, can you speak uh, up, sir? We can barely hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. About the police resources, um, I understand we're completely stretched and everything. Just walking back from work on the A316 by the Richmond roundabout, there, uh, there, there's a couple of police chaps trying to catch speeders. Now, the way things are, is that the right way to go about putting police resources at this moment in time? I don't think so. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is um, the number of rough sleepers and aggressive begging that's going on in Richmond at this moment in time, what can be done about that? And of course, those rough sleepers are urinating all over the place as well. That's the second point. The third point is the number of people having barbecues on the actual green and on the little green. And the fourth point, slightly off topic a little bit here, with that development that's uh, earmarked for consultation up near, uh, up near home base, um, it's uh, a quite a compact, crowded type of development, and I don't need to tell anybody how crowded already is around here with the traffic and people anyway. Uh, if they put more flats and, and condensed housing in there, it's going to make the problem even worse. So there's a, a four okay. points. Okay, I think we, we, we did quite cover, you may have come in late, we covered home base yeah. off quite extensively earlier. Oh, so. Right. So roughs, I mean, there's the, the police may wish to comment on whether we should be enforcing against speeding on the 316. It may be a different uh, unit, but more, more, more pressing, I think, would be the issue of rough sleepers. We've not heard anything about this evening. So um, one of our ward councillors who wishes to address the issue of rough sleepers. Yeah, well, why don't I say something about Thank that? Thank you, Richard. Um, I mean, since the introduction of coronavirus, we have offered hotel accommodation to all registered homeless people in the borough. And the great majority of them have taken it up and the great majority of them have now been safely housed in local hotel accommodation. There are a small number of rough sleepers who point blank refuse to accept any form of accommodation at all. We also, as a local authority, we strongly work with uh, SPEAR, which is a local homeless charity, you know, based on the, uh, based in the centre of Richmond, to provide homeless accommodation for people who are for one reason or another, uh, without a home. But we're not able to compel people 
to, um, to, uh, to accept accommodation if they choose not to do so. We are working with the police and the police do um, take action against aggressive begging. And quite often aggressive begging is actually associated with drug dealing. So one of the problems we have in our ward is a local drug dealer who operates not a million miles away from Rally Road. And in order to boost his income, in addition to, uh, to, to, to selling drugs, he chooses to uh, beg from time to time in an aggressive way in the Sainsbury's area and so forth. So the local police are well aware of these individuals and they do take action against them. Um, so I think that's the best situation I can answer on that. Can I just secondly say that I disagree with the gentleman about speeding. Uh, speeding is an issue, particularly on the Q Road and on the A316, and I don't want to discourage the police from sporadically taking action against speeders, because it does cause a great deal of distress to a lot of local people. Okay, can I come in this year? Um, yes, of course, but you must speak up, madam. You're, you're very far away from the microphone. There we go. Okay, my issue with this, you know, rough sleepers, and okay, with the, with the COVID-19, we are very scared of the, all these, you know, virus situation. And we are forced to wear the mask for most of the public places, actually all the public places. And, but again, they are really smelly, dirty, especially with this heat. And just everywhere, the you know, urinating, and and you know, when you are coming through the area next to the uh, let's say mm -hmm. train station next to the Tesco, it is unacceptable. And also with the drugs, and I have encountered with the drug dealers, couple of occasions in front of my eyes, they were selling the drugs, and they don't have any scared. One of them it was car park near to the uh, the river. One of them, it was Richmond Terrace, in front of it. And funnily enough, a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of uh, car uh, uh, down, there was a police auto. I, don't, I didn't understand how these people have uh, encouraged and they can sell the drugs and they openly, and there is three, four uh, cars, there is a police auto that. I don't understand. I, I'm just, you know, raising the questions over here. And... I'm telling you, the drug uh, selling in this area. I am, I am in this area, and I'm working from home. And I wait, uh, I do the twice a walk because I'm trying to lose weight. Every year, every day, I am in the Richmond Green and it's in the in the uh, Riverside. And how many occasions I am encountering by my staff? As you know, unacceptable. Whatever, whatever you are saying, I've been, I've been in the, this call since you started. And whatever you find excuses, you are saying that, oh, we don't have the resource, blah, blah, blah. I find out you just come along when there is a problem. And your resources may be not enough. But again, something's happened when you come along. It's not enough. Too little. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Would anybody like to comment? Um, Anita Buckwell. Yeah, 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 yes, I would like to comment on that. And um, um, our resident is quite right. Very sadly, um, drug dealing is endemic right across, uh, right across Richmond. Uh, and um, um, oh, they, they're the subject of aggressive begging and um, homelessness was, was mentioned earlier. Um, the beggars uh, returned after COVID, if they ever went away, the professional beggars, because we know that there are groups of professional beggars who come in and set themselves up in George Street, etc., and across Richmond. Um, um, and at the same time, um, now that we have very good weather, uh, and, and um, a, a lot of we have seen an increase again of um, homeless people um, living uh, rough on the streets. Um, I do think the police can move. Um, those who are sleeping rough on, on the pavement. I do believe that they can move them on. Um, I do believe also that they can move um, beggars on. Um, but this isn't happening, of course, because um, the safer neighbourhood team that we have, the two constables and the uh, um, uh, um, community support officer, um, are run off uh, their legs on other things. And it also points to the reason why we need a town-centred team, because this low level of ASB that goes on all the time needs to be dealt with. We need a, a daily presence presence in, 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 in Richmond, which is dedicated to Richmond, to try and sort this out. Um, if we go on and we just allow more and more people to set up 
their beds on uh, in George Street and more and more people to um, beg. We put off shoppers. We put off people who want to do business in Richmond and it's to the overall detriment of our high street. Yeah. There yeah, you go. Good. That's great. Can I add something to that as well? If, if it's quick, sir, because I need to wrap the yeah, evening yeah, up. Sure, sure. because uh, this, this, this relation with the drugs and the homeless and the aggressive breaking actually started, I noticed it about two years ago, where there were just kiddies, uh, teenagers coming down just to do drugs. I said to my wife, Phyllis, I said, the end result of this is an escalation and there will be drug dealing happening in the area because they tell their friends it's a quiet neighborhood, not very well policed, and they can openly do whatever they want. So that's how it escalates. And I don't know what I don't know what the road further is from here. Maybe gang violence or something, drug related or something. There's already incidents happening, as you can see in front of our eyes now, right? So um, something really needs to be done now, and it needs to be done quickly. Okay. I, I, th I think possibly the phrase "very heavily policed" rather than "not very well policed," um, because I think that the guys who are our police do an enormous amount with, with very, very, very limited resources and, and you know, depleted numbers. I think if I, if I might, Gareth, if, if yes, I, I know you want to wrap this up, um, my, my officers have made um, uh, three or four um, arrests for, for vagrancy related offences this year. Um, mm. with, with one uh, particular gentleman who um, I'm sure many of you will recognise in, in the sort of North Richmond and, and Kew areas, um, he, uh, we, we've actually served him with papers that working with your guys at the council, um, we've managed to try and secure an, a hearing for an injunction against him, um, which is something almost sort of a trial as it were at the moment, but something that we'd be keen to, to use on our more sort of persistent and aggressive um, beggars who are causing antisocial behaviour. Um, it, it, is, it is a separate issue as far as the drugs goes. We have um, a, a class A sort of contingent of drug takers being a lot of our homeless people. Um, so far as moving them on, um, uh, as Peter, as you said, um, you know very well how much I would love to have a town centre team. It is, it is my dream um, uh, and it is, it is something that we, we can do, but in those circumstances, often I think we need to strike that balance between those who are sort of um, down on their luck and, 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 and not having a very good time of life at the moment and the ones who are actually, you know, taking drugs, dealing drugs, causing ASP. Um, so that's kind of where we shift our focus. Okay, I will end the, well, not end the evening, but I'll have the last words. I'll just read out a comment from Helen Sujiyama here, which is uh, a complex, rough sleeping, a complex issue that can't simply be tackled by strict policing. It's related to mental health and all that, that entails. So, yeah, that, that is true. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, listen, it's, we're already 15 minutes over time. Um, we could be here for the next hour and a half, I imagine. Um, but thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much for the patient way in which you have put the questions. Um, I appreciate that this is an issue which is causing grave concern. It's causing grave concern to you. It's causing grave concern to the council, all of your councillors, to my officers, to the police. It is something that we are trying to get on top of. And we are continuing the dialogue and trying to, you know, direct the resources as best as we can. And we are listening to the suggestions which are coming forward. And I'm in regular contact with the very highest levels of the police to funnel those suggestions through. So what I'm going to do now is thank all of the councillors who've taken part this evening. It's Councillor Richard Pine, Councillor Richard Warren and Councillor Nancy Baldwin for uh, North Richmond. Councillor Bill Newton Dunn, Councillor Peter Buckwell and Councillor Pamela Fleming for South Richmond. And of course, um, all of the communications officers and the community engagement team who really keep this whole thing running and make sure that you're all aware of it and, you know, make the whole thing come to life, which is grand. But of course, as always, with things like this, this is a community conversation. So the biggest thanks go chiefly to yourselves. Thank you and good night.